Welcome to the Cyber Journey Show, brought to you by CyberX. I am your host, Daniel Pinsky. This is the one and only place where you're going to get key learnings and insights from cybersecurity leaders and entrepreneurs. Look, we look to our leaders to show us how to think, behave, and act when it really matters. And my goal is that I can share with you those experiences and learnings from their journey. We can apply those to ours and grow not only as individuals, but as a community, as a nation. So Cyber Journey Nation, let's get started. Our featured leader today is incredible. She's a privacy expert. She's an entrepreneur. She's a speaker. And she was recently named as one of the top 20 Canadian women in cyber. So let's meet my friend and soon to be yours, Kat Code. Kat, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So inaugural show. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm excited. I, I thought you were the perfect guest to kick this off. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm super excited to be here. Now, now you've set the bar super high. Now I set the bar down super high. from here. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to cover a lot today. Um, but I found I find your journey very very interesting. Obviously, uh, somebody who started in industry and then and then made a pivot into her own entrepreneurial venture. Uh, maybe you can walk myself and our audience uh, kind of through that was like what what that was like. Like, what was the catalyst for you to then start your own entrepreneurial journey? Awesome. All right. So way back, not that far back, but way back. Uh, so I was uh, engineering. Um, I did a combined degree in computer and electrical engineering. And from there, I went to work for Research in Motion, which a lot of people just RIM. know is BlackBerry. Yes, yes. RIM. See, yeah, everyone's just like, heck is RIM? BlackBerry. Um, so I, that's where I spent the bulk of my career. I was there for, I actually did design computer games before that. Um, but uh, yeah, I did software design, software development, software architecture, and senior management. Um, it was it was an excellent learning experience because RIM really still had that startup feel, even though we were a fair amount of people when I started. Uh, but then as the company grew and then started to kind of silo into these departments, there were a lot of lessons learned even just there on how the it developed and separated. So before I left at the end, I was leading the handheld architecture team for the device. There were other architecture teams for um, enterprise software, which I also had worked on in the time that I was there. Uh, so there was a lot of coordination amongst the teams. Uh, we did have, I don't know if anyone remembers the playbook, which <laughs> is like, it was the, it was I, I the don't early iPad. <laughs> um, yeah. So there was an architecture team for that. Okay. So I, I had 75 people reporting to me wow. and I loved management. Um, it was wonderful, but it, it was one of those jobs. And if other people have been in this position where I spent nine to five managing everyone else and the projects and the teams, and then at five o'clock people went home and then I started my work. Okay. Uh, it was around that time where I had my first child. And then I said, I can't be responsible for this many people because I now have to be responsible for someone else. And that was the catalyst for me um, to reduce my work hours. So that was kind of the start of it for me. And, and other people will find this too. I think we have to kill this notion, which we can talk about entirely differently, um, of this, this 80 hour work week. It doesn't work for anybody. Um, it didn't work for me. So I went back to RIM and I said, look, you can either, you know, pay me for 25 hours and you will probably get 40 hours of work out of me, or you can pay me for 40 hours and you will get 40 hours of work out of me, but I can't work. I can't work these insane hours anymore. And so they allowed me to actually come back part time. Um, wow. Yes. So I worked three days a week for several years. Uh, nobody knew I was working three days a week. And what I learned from that was that if, if I knew I had to get more done in less time, I could. And I was doing this thing where I had two of those five work days off, uh, where I could catch up on things. I was with my daughter, but I could catch up on things like grocery and housework and stuff like that, which also meant when I was at work, I was focused on work. Like I could really get a solid eight hours in where other people were petering out by the end of the week because work is exhausting. I had enough energy to get a really full weekend. Uh, so that went on for a couple of years. And then I decided I really needed to control. I had a, another child. And then I decided I really needed to control 
my schedule. And I had seen it now. I had like kind of this proof of concept where I had gone from working ridiculous full-time hours to working less hours and getting more done. So I am a fundamental believer in that. You can get more done in less time if you have focused time to do it in and you are able to kind of recover between that work time. Uh, so that is that was the catalyst for me to launch my own company was really to control those hours and and be able to have the freedom to get a lot done in in the times I had and then do what I needed to do in other times. Wow. So like what type of productivity hacks do you use? Like how were you able to do that, condense the amount of time that you had to be more productive, more effective? Um, I think some of it, again, is the mental break. You know, like people say you need to you need to take a break. Like you can't just sit and stare at a computer all day long. Having that day off in between was certainly allowed. I'm, was I thinking about work? Sure. Was I answering the odd email? Yes. But I wasn't sitting down and doing it. It allowed me the space to actually consider stuff. So I, I will do that even now where I know people are like, you should not worry about work all the time. But um, like, so I swim and while I'm swimming, I will be like, okay, what am I going to do with this project? And yeah. just taking the time away from um, your computer and staring at it and thinking about it. So going for a walk, taking your dogs for a walk, whatever it is, getting away from the actual environment in which that problem sits and thinking about it in another way will often reveal solutions and allow you to work kind of the whole work, work smarter, not harder thing. But um, that certainly helped. I also found because I knew I was only there for three days, I didn't take lunch breaks and I didn't. So I didn't, you know, I didn't go off for an hour. Um, for lunch, I would bring my lunch, I would get everything done, I knew I had to get it done in that time window. Um, so I think that helped too. having that kind of like, I need to get this done in this day. And so I just got down to it and just did it. Wow. So obviously, during that transition, um, I'm sure you learned quite a lot. So kind of what is one thing that you believe about becoming successful, or maybe helped you in your success that maybe a lot of other people don't know about? I think that, well, I, I, so the journey of being an entrepreneur is what taught me a lot about the definition of success when there's this crazy notion about money and, and everyone's going to be like, obviously, um, money is time and time is money. Like, and, and people don't realize that, like, I, I, I get that a lot. And you and I have talked about this before where people are like, oh, I have an extra job for you. And I'm like, I don't want it. I don't want to spend any more time working in that month and people are like, but it's this much money, yeah. but it's hours of my life. Yes. So when I started my business, I was in an accelerator. I was developing a piece of software because I used to be a software director. So people are like, perfect, you go develop this. Um, and I was on a trajectory to grow the company, have employees and all this stuff. And I'm looking at it going, that's not what I want. They're like, oh, but you could make this much money. Yeah. I was like, but I don't want to go back to 80 hour work weeks where I'm managing a whole ton of people. I, I want, like I did this to control my hours. It is very difficult to stay true to that focus, right? You have to kind of say, this is what I want to do and then tell everyone else to go away. <laughs> but I still, I still like, why don't you go work for this company? I had offers at the beginning from all sorts of companies. And I was like, I don't care what you're offering me. I don't want to work 80 hour weeks. So what is the definition of success to you? If it's money, great, then let it be money. But if it's, is it money is the, is the question, is it money? Is it, is it recognition? Is it the ability to do something you love? Is it ability to control your hours? Is it a combination of some things? Like, I'm not going to say, oh, I'll work for free because I don't care about money. <laughs> Obviously, yeah, it, does, it does give you things. Yeah, there has to be a return. But to me, there's a balance between yes. do I enjoy the job? It does, is the payment a good return on investment for this job? And is it worth my time and hours to do it? So I, I have a lot of factors that I factor in. Uh, in order to determine what jobs I'm actually going to take. And then that's how I look at success. I am trying to take most of the summer off because I should be able to do that. That will be success to me. If I can reduce my hours all the way down over the summer, that will be success to me. And I think that would be incredible. And, and in my mind, at least the way you're describing, and that's perhaps one of the reasons why you wanted to shift away from working in a corporate environment to having your own, your own business, right? Yeah. It's interesting that you say that. I find um, our attitude towards work in North America versus other parts of the world is quite different. In North America, we're driven from a very young age to live to work, where in Europe, it tends to be more, well, I work to live. 
And it kind of sounds like you've adopted that attitude, which I think is a very healthy attitude. Trying, trying to. Trying, trying. <laughs> so, I mean, over your time at, at, at Research in Motion, um, who, looking back on your career, who's been your most important professional mentor and why? Um, that's a good question. So the, the, most, the most important one was actually the one I had after. Um, I think there were, I had advocates at RIM for sure. Like again, the, the VP who stood up for me when I said, I want to come back part-time who wow. actually said, I'll allow you to, um, like really made a statement and set a precedent. Uh, I do remember being in a meeting with all of these VPs and it was five o'clock and I had to go get my daughter from daycare. Um, and, uh, like again, m- also supportive partner, like my husband also does a lot of the work, but at that day I had to go get her and I'm looking around this room and a bunch of middle-aged men, none of whom I know have to go get their kids. Cause most of them have stay at home wives or yeah. nannies. And I'm like, I have to go. And nobody judged it. Like I felt judged. So I was like, I, I am killing my career. Cause I have to get up right now to go get my kid. And everyone else is just going to stay in this meeting for another half an hour. But they, that, that was my attitude, not theirs. And, and understanding that, um, because they didn't give me that impression and being like, okay, no, I'm okay to do this. Like when I stood up and I said, so sorry, guys, I got to go, I got to get, and they were all like, great, go, go. This is great. We'll send you the notes. This is awesome. That's so having that support, um, that made a difference, but the, the most impactful mentor I had was a woman when I was building my business who taught me all about sunk cost fallacy, uh, which is the, if you spend a lot of money on something, just because you have done that doesn't mean you should continue to spend a lot of money on it. So uh, as I had said before, I was building a piece of software. My heart wasn't in it. Everyone was telling me I had to do it because there were too few women who were running software companies like this and I had to do it. Uh, And I listened to others. And I sat down with her and I'm like, I don't know what to do with this app. I'm going to have to do this. Um, It's causing me so much stress. And she looked at me and she's like, just because you spent a lot of money creating this app doesn't mean you should continue to put money into this mistake. You, you will be better off walking away today than you will if you keep putting money in it. Uh, And she was a hundred percent right. And like, I, I didn't know the terminology at the time, but now I'm, it is the same with all sorts of things in life. We tend to like, I've spent so much money on this project. I don't want to walk away from it. I've spent so much time on this thing. Like I've learned to do this thing. I have to do something with it. No, you don't. So I, you may have a degree in something and you're like, but I spent all this money and time getting that degree. I have to use it. You yeah. don't have to use it because you probably also learned time prioritization and networking and, yeah. and all sorts of other skills that came out of getting that degree other than the actual knowledge in that degree that it's not wasted. Nothing is wasted. It's always a lesson learned. Um, But that was the best advice I ever had. So you have to start doing uh, what's right for you, not necessarily what you've already sunk a lot of investment into. Yeah, that's it. It's an interesting way to see it. Um, I've worked with so many people in this industry, like I'm sure you have, that their backgrounds are not in cyber or not in computers or not in information technology. And a lot of the skills that you get in, you know, other degrees, depending on what you've studied, they're they're so transferable um, to our industry. Like I've worked with really good leaders who have a background in philosophy or the arts or the humanities. At the end of the day, and I always tell the those who report into me, it's always about people. And do you have the ability to build relationships with people? And that's how you move things, your agenda forward. And that is the most important thing, not not what your background is. I totally agree with that. And from a management perspective, you can take a course. Courses are useful, but there is an innate ability to manage, I fully believe, that doesn't come from anything that you can learn. Um, So if you want to manage a team that has an expertise you don't know, if you are able to understand those team members and help remove obstacles from their work and help them to get, that's your job to me as a manager is to help your team do the best job they can do. It's not necessarily to do their job. So it, it really depends on the company and some companies that management is also supposed to do whatever it is. Like they are supposed to be developers or, or they're supposed to know how to do pen testing. But in some cases, if you can help people manage their time and remove the obstacles and make sure they are doing the best pen testing they can do, and they're creating good policies and procedures, then that is the job. And you could come from any background to do that. You just need to know how to be able to do that, how to facilitate other people's work. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And I tell the people that report into me all the time, I believe my job as leaders to remove obstacles from their paths so they're successful and they continue to grow and mature and they can achieve their goals. I truly see that as my job to facilitate. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Let's shift a little bit. Uh, name me one thing that maybe people don't know about you or maybe misunderstand about you. Oh, that's a hard, as in cyber? <laughs> Just in general, either in cyber, professionally, personally. Um, okay, so this is something you and I have talked about. I am an outgoing introvert. Um, really? Okay. And, and people will fight me on it. And that's frustrating because it's also <laughs> tiring as an introvert to fight people on who you are innately. Um, I'm very outgoing. I network like crazy when I'm at a conference. That's how I met a lot of my professional contacts. And people are like, oh, I met you at this conference. And I was like, hey, I also met you at this conference. Um, I'm also a professional speaker. So I am used to getting like, right, being on. I am used to getting on a stage, yeah. thousands of people. I don't care. Uh, but I find the people part of networking exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we've um, spoken about this. Totally uh, exhausting. Oh, it's interesting, yeah. introversion. Um, like we've spoken about this. I think it's something that a lot of people in our industry, I don't want to say struggle with, but a lot of people are like this way. Um, and, you know, like, so what is introversion in, in your opinion? Like, I have my own definition. Uh, Susan Cain wrote a really fantastic book called Quiet. And it's the best analogy I've ever heard around introversion. And it's, and it's what I use. So somebody who is introverted at the beginning of the day, they wake up and they have coins in their hand and, the, and those coins represent energy. And over the course of the day, via interaction or meetings, they give away those coins. And then by the end of the day, they feel depleted. So they have to find a way to recharge. People who are extroverted, they wake up with no coins. And via interaction and communication, they actually gain coins and that gives them energy. So to me, that is the best definition, explanation I've ever heard about introversion. It's about energy management. Um, and I'm interested to hear what your definition is or understanding of, of it. And the fact that you are, well, how do you navigate that? Like what things are you doing uh, within your career or between like very public events to, to manage that? So you get back that energy so you can serve your audience. Yeah, oh, all great questions. So I agree with the book. If people haven't read it, I suggest they read it, especially if you are in management because it will really help you better understand some of the people that that are working for you. And yeah. like, as you and I have just discussed, your job as a leader is to remove obstacles. It's difficult to remove obstacles if you don't understand what those obstacles are. So definitely recommend um, the book Quiet. So to me, I, I'm always working on this distinction between introversion and shy and extroversion and outgoing. Um, so shy is I'm, I'm afraid to talk to people. I get anxious talking to people. I don't want to talk to new people. I don't like meeting them. That's really hard for me, which is its own thing. Um, outgoing is I'm happy to meet new people. I don't really get nervous in a room that that's, that's a very different kind of energy. And then shyness too, is something if you're looking to network that, that you need strategies and ways to overcome. Um, whereas, as you said, introversion and extroversion is an energy replenishment. So if, if I'm at a conference all day, um, I really just want to go back to how my house or my hotel room and just either read or watch crappy TV and not talk to anyone. Uh, <laughs> whereas other people are like, Hey, let's go grab a drink. Yeah. Um, not good for me. So. <laughs> I'm exactly so, the same. I'm, I'm yeah. introverted as well. Yeah. And understanding that. So I know there was a software company uh, in Waterloo where I am that built like they built pods where there were like six, six desks that all kind of faced each other for the extroverts. And then they built other pods off against the wall that were three walled for the introverts so that they could say That's incredible. Yeah, you can select, do you want to be surrounded by people and 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 so you can engage constantly or do you really just need to be separate so you can function alone? Uh, I think the pandemic was a real eye-opener for people. Uh, yeah. My whole family's introverts. Yes. So did we miss activities? Yes. But were we like, let's just chill because that's what we do? Yes. Like this pandemic was fine for us where yeah. I saw other people really struggling with this. Yeah. We need to set up Friday night things every Friday at seven, we're going to get on a zoom call. I'm like, I miss, I miss my friends cause I like them, but I don't, I don't miss seeing people and getting together with people. So if you're looking for like a, what am I, I don't know. <laughs> you can kind of use this pandemic as a litmus test to say, was I affected by my isolation or did I kind of enjoy 
just being able to not have to go to so many events. Um, that's yeah. a that's a kind of a good way of of looking at it. And I saw the same as well for people in my circle, people who are introverted. Uh, you know, some people. I mean, I don't want to say liked, but for them, the pandemic was productive. They were still yeah. able to get their jobs done. They always had tons of energy. Other people in my circle that I know are very extroverted. It was terrible for them because they need to see people. Yeah. Like one of my old co- one of my older coaches, she needs to be around people. That's how she gets her energy. And this pandemic was difficult for her. So it, it's it, I think the important takeaway here is it's important to know what you are and then how to manage what you are to benefit you both personally and professionally. And to me, yeah. really, that's what the takeaway is. For sure. And it's also out of your comfort zone. Like you, yeah, if you want to move up in your career, if you want to meet new people, you can't just say, I'm an introvert, so I'm not going to go or I'm not going to, or even yes. again, shyness. I'm not going to approach people. No, you set a goal. I'm going to talk to three people I've never talked to before, or yes. I'm going to try and stay until four o'clock in this networking yes. event. Um, it will be uncomfortable. And like yes. you always hear growth comes from discomfort, literally yes. growth comes from discomfort. So, so to say, you and I to say, hey, this is like, we're going to go to this conference and it's uncomfortable, but we'll do it because it's part of what we need to do. That's, that's growth. If you say, I can't go to the conference because it makes me feel uneasy, then, then that's fine if you're okay with being where you are. But if you want to move laterally up, whatever, then you need to push yourself out of that comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. Growth and comfort cannot coexist, right? And when you know you're uncomfortable, you're growing. So as much as it's uncomfortable to be, in those like situations, it is important from a growth point of view. I completely agree. So as a leader, how do we grow up? How do we, how do we continue to grow as leaders and mature? And like, what are those areas in your career that you think it's really important to focus on? I'm, I'm very, well, okay. So I'm in privacy and privacy is an ever changing thing. So is cybersecurity, but privacy is part of the umbrella of cybersecurity, but cyber as a whole and privacy are moving targets. So I'm very much like this is all a journey and not a destination. Like you can't, you can be SOC 2 compliant today and not in five years because your technology's changed, because the, the threshold has changed, because something is new is happening. We know with cyber threats that they are always evolving. Yeah. So um, my biggest thing is, is you can't be stagnant in where you are. You can't just say, I'm, I'm good at what I do now. And so I'm just going to do it. You always have to be learning. You always have to be looking to adapt. Um, and, and like, I think the, the most powerful thing for me is always the, I don't know what I don't know. Um, I, I really, one of my biggest pet peeves is being in a meeting with someone who can't say, I don't know, like you get on a call with me and I say, Hey, what about this? And they're like, I'm not sure. I'm going to go look into that for you. Utmost respect. (laughs) But if you start, if you start going, Oh, uh, well, that's this. And I'm like, are you telling me something to tell me something? Because that's not helpful to (laughs) anybody. So the, the I like I, at least at least once a week, once a day, somebody will say, what about this regulation? And I'll say, I don't know. I don't have every privacy regulation memorized. I don't know. And they're changing. So so knowing that you can't know everything and that you always there's always more to learn and more to adapt. That would be, I think, really key, especially in our field, especially in cybersecurity right now. Yeah, I completely agree. And for everybody out there, it's, it's quite often the people that want to take that question back and reflect. Those people sometimes are the introverts. And they need that reflection time. But those are also the same people often that bring back the most value because they actually take the time to really think about the question because they care. Yeah. So what about, um, I have no doubt, I certainly do. uh, All of us, we deal with blind spots in our careers. So what's maybe a blind spot for you in, in your career or that maybe something that you're not particularly, not that you're not good at, but something, an area that you want to grow in. You're good at everything, Kat. Um, and like, how do you manage it? Oh, so I don't like business development. So I have basically offset that. So I love the meat of what I do. I love consulting. I love helping people. I love speaking, but I don't, I don't love sales. I don't love marketing. Like I don't like that aspect of it. So, um, and then that's, again, that's a lesson learned. I have the ability because it's my company to kind of say, where do I want to move? What do I want to do? Uh, but I have 
found ways to partner. I work for KPMG. I work with other cyber partners um, where they find me work. And it's a win-win for both of us because they need privacy help and cybersecurity help. And I don't want to look for the clients. So some people don't like that. Some people only want to deal with their own clients. They want to control the job. They want to control the timeline. And I'm like, you know what? You tell me what you have. And if it works for me, here's how I'm willing to do the project. So I still have control over that. Here's what I'm willing to offer for this price at this time. Um, but I don't have to find the clients. So that that's what's worked best for me. Um, uh, because I don't like that aspect of it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's about being mature enough to identify what your sweet spot is and then focusing on it. Look, at the end of the day, we're not all going to be good at every aspect of our career, and that's okay. Surround yourself with people who are good at the things that you might not be good at or that you don't want to do, yeah. right? And, and, and let them prop you up. And I think that's kind of the most important takeaway. Um, I Look, as we're growing, all of us, we have missteps. Uh, we have failures, and I know I've definitely had a lot of instances of that in my career. Uh, for you, I have no doubt in your career you've had those tough moments where you've taken away key learnings, takeaways, maybe you've had to pivot. Maybe give us an example of a failure that's really shaped your life, and how were you before and how were you after? So this, this it's, it, you know, you have to hit bottom to crawl back up again. Yes. Um, I had a vision of really helping again, in helping people understand privacy and, and how their online data was being used and abused. Um, I was driven towards creating a piece of software that would help identify what was out there about you. And there are other companies that'll do that, that'll say, hey, here's, what's, here's what I could find on the internet about you. But what I had developed was the education because that's where that's what I love to do. I love to teach people. Like I don't want to just say, here's your results. I want to say, here's why they matter and what you need to do differently and how to make it better. So that's basically, I would say, hey, you know, like you've got location in your photos. Here's why that matters. Here are the risks about it. Here's how to fix it. Um, that was the direction I was going. Again, I was being pushed to create a company with a lot of people and a lot of things. Um, this was the same where this woman told me to stop investing money in this. But the stress of that, of trying to make everyone else happy um, caused, I, I have asthma. So it caused my asthma to get so bad that yeah. I was completely depleted. I was like, the doctor said I had adrenal failure. Like it was, I was exhausted all the time from the stress, yeah. not from work, from the stress of trying to make something I didn't want to make um, to make other people happy that wasn't working the way I had envisioned it working. Uh, and so that was kind of my catalyst moment where I'm like, I need to do what I want to do and not try and please others. So, so that was a month of me <laughs> forcibly. Cause I, you could probably imagine I'm a go, go, go person. Yeah. I, every day I, I had to watch a movie every afternoon <laughs> just to force myself to sit so that I wouldn't get up and do something. It was the only way I could recover for two or three weeks. I had to literally watch a movie every day where some people are like, that sounds delightful. Um, but that was really <laughs> hard for me to do. Uh, and then anyone who's ever had young kids, I was like, I missed like five years of movies that had come out. So I was like, great, <laughs> can I go watch all the movies I never got to see in the theater? Um, but I get, I, I physically made myself ill from the stress of trying to please others. And so that was definitely a failure point. Um, still under my company brand, still under privacy and cybersecurity. And I just went, this isn't me. And I'm going to go just do me. So I often get the, when I, when I tell people I'm at capacity and I can't take more work for this month, everyone's like, well, why don't you hire someone? I'm like, because that is not, that is not what I do. I do, I take the work I can do in the time I have. Um, if I hired someone else to take more work from me and then they had a family emergency or there was a problem, I would have to take on their work. So been there, done that, had a lot of people I had to do work for. And I'm like, I'm, I am just serving myself now. So that was, it, it doesn't work for everyone. It works for me. That's what worked for me. So that was my biggest, my biggest thing was to stop doing what others wanted me to do and to do what I could do successfully. Wow. And to be honest, uh, your example 
actually hits me uh, pretty hard because I actually went through, we've never spoken about this, but I've actually, I went through something very, very similar uh, where I had, what I was told that I was exhausted, I was needing, I, I had adrenal fatigue. So I went through very, something very similar and I can completely empathize with that. And how many it movies did you watch in that window of time? <laughs> I didn't watch movies. Uh, I actually, it, it's a long story, but it, it took me many, many months to actually build myself back up. Uh, but it's, you know, you get to, you can get to a, a very dark place. So I can certainly empathize with that. I certainly can. Um, all right. So I think we're at the point where I have this thing called the lightning round, where it's going to be five questions that I asked everybody. So get ready. So question number one. If you were meeting with somebody, maybe a recent college graduate, or maybe somebody that had been in the industry for a year or two, what is that one general piece of life or career guidance or advice that you would give them? Uh, things take time. Uh, you will like define success the way you want to define it, but it takes time to get there. It, this isn't uh, overnight of, I want to do what I want to do. This is I want to do what I want to do. So I'm going to build the career and the clout and the knowledge to be able to get there. Fantastic. Quite the value bomb. Awesome. What is one book that you'd recommend to uh, our audience and why? The Happiness Equation, which pretty much summed up. Great book. So, have you read it? Neil Frisha? Uh -huh. Yeah. So I am very much, this, he is, he beautifully articulates this time versus money concept and that you can work more and make more money and pay people to do stuff. Or you can work less and do that stuff yourself. It, you know, it's, it's up to you what you want to do, but just acknowledge the fact that that's the choice that you're making. Fantastic. What is one podcast that you would recommend and why? I am the only technically evolved person on the planet who doesn't listen to podcasts. Really? Really. Wow. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. A out lot of, of books on tape. I will listen to books on tape, but I don't listen to podcasts. Like not actual physical tapes, right? No. Okay. <laughs> no audiobooks. You're gonna I have to love, explain that to the audience. <laughs> I love autobiographies read by the author on audiobook, with the exception okay. of Neil Gaiman and his Norse mythology, which I could just listen to on replay forever. But I don't know if I've ever heard a podcast on I don't even have the player on my phone. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. So out of our entire conversation, uh, we've covered quite a bit in, in about a half hour. What is that one key takeaway or that one value bomb that you would hope somebody comes away with and something that maybe they can implement in their own life? Oh, of all of the things, um, I think some cost fallacy is a life lesson you kind of have to learn. Okay. But I, I think that is the one that hurts people the most. So just because you've spent time, resources, money, or energy on something, if it is a mistake for you and it's not where you should be, don't feel like you should continue to waste on it. Yeah, that's a fantastic lesson. So how can Cyber Journey Nation learn more about you, what you have going on, and how to connect? Oh, uh, you can find me at catcode.com with two O's um, and uh, C-A-T-C-O-O-D-E. Uh, and um, I'm on LinkedIn, that people are welcome to come seek me out. And uh, I have a company site at binarytattoo.com. Awesome. Thank you. So remember, everybody, that you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And today you've been spending time with CC and DP. So thank you for that. Kat, I just want to say thank you for sharing your truth, your wisdom, and your value with Cyber Journey Nation. For that, we say thank you and take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. Kat delivered so much value for us. Now is the time in our show for our top takeaways. What are those key things that we can take away today and then implement tomorrow? The first thing I would like to talk about is this idea of focus. So Kat said that we really can achieve a lot more in a shorter period of time, but only if we focus. And she's absolutely correct. There's a fantastic book out there that I can recommend called Deep Work, written by Cal Newport. And then what the book teaches us is as people, we actually can't multitask. What we actually end up doing is something called context switching. 
So as we switch from context to context, it actually takes us about 15, 20, 25 minutes to get focused again and fully immersed in whatever that new task is. So the only thing we actually end up doing is being less effective, less efficient, and less productive. One of the strategies that the book teaches us and something that I have implemented years ago fundamentally shifted not only how I work, but also how productive I am, is actually booking deep work focus time with ourselves. So for instance, at the beginning of a month or the beginning of a week, identify what are those two or three goals or, or milestones or objectives that you've got to get done. And then go into your calendar and book 90 minute slots with yourself. And during that focus time, turn off all other noise. That means no social media, no email, no internet, no bings and dings. And I think if you implement this strategy, you will see how productive you can be in a much shorter period of time. The second key takeaway, and probably the question I get asked the most is, how do I level up my career? How do I go from an individual contributor into a position of leadership, managing people or teams? And there's a massive amount of research and books that have been published on this one topic. And what that research shows us is that to be a good leader, it doesn't have a lot to do with where you went to school or what degree you have or your upbringing, but the foundation of that success is our ability to build and grow relationships with other people. Because it is through those relationships that we actually get things done and we drive value to the organization. And I think if that's what you focus on, we kind of shift that paradigm. Well, our organizations are gonna keep giving us more responsibility. And often that includes leading people and teams. A fantastic book for this from probably my favorite leadership author, which is John Maxwell, is The Five Levels of Leadership. And he does a fantastic job of explaining what are those different levels of leadership and how you mature and grow from one level to the next. The last key takeaway is the idea of being an introvert versus an extrovert. Growing up, Kat mentioned it, I'm an introvert. And the impression I had from society is that being an introvert was almost, it was a detriment to my career or it was a weakness. But in fact, some of the most influential and impactful leaders of our, of our time have been introverts. And we did mention the book Quiet by Susan Cain. I fully recommend that book. But plus some of the people that were introverts that probably you're aware of or might not be aware of, Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, Steve Wozniak, Bill Gates, Charles Darwin. So being an introvert, it's not a detriment. It is not a weakness. If anything, it is a silent superpower. The main takeaway here is learn who you are, understand who you are, and learn how to manage who you are to your benefit, both personally and professionally. If you found this show useful, I encourage you to, set, to tell just one person in your circle that this show can help them on their journey. Leave us a review. I want to know what you liked, what you didn't like, and how we can improve. Your input will shape what you hear and what topics we cover. Finally, Cyber Journey Nation. Thank you for listening. And until next time, keep learning and keep growing.